Christy, it was good to see them today, both of them. They were, uh, they used to come over to my house at Christmas time and help us. Uh, my wife, well, it was probably me that made us do it, but we would put popcorn and cranberries on our Christmas tree and we would string it around and around and around. And I never got like a little Christmas, I got, you know, Sasquatch, the Chris, Christmas tree. So it took a long time to do, but Christy and Liz would come over and we would just have a ball. We'd be stringing it and then, you know, you'd hear somebody say, ow, you know, prick themselves with the needle. And, but we just had fun. It was so much, it was a blast having them over. But uh, it's good to see them again. Uh, I think the choir sounded great today. And I think it was because there was a little Kentucky uh, accent there. <laughs> Little southern, southern charm. Okay, now I know what time it is, and I am not going to keep you late tonight. But I thought we'd do something a little bit different. <clears throat> Does everybody have a Bible in front of them? Grab your Bible, everybody, everyone. Come on, Jen. I'm counting on you. All right. Alan, get your Bible. No electronic devices. <laughs> Johanna? <laughs> okay, everybody, Seth, you got one? Okay. All right, so here's what you do. I'm going to give you a verse, and you look it up, and the first one that finds it, stand up as quickly as you can and read the verse to me, okay? Everybody, Bible's up. Get your Bible up in the air. Close your Bible. Close your Bible. Ready? Psalm 31, 24. Go. Tim. Be of good courage, and you shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Tim. See, I knew. I... I just didn't want these young kids to get it all at us, so thank you, Tim. All right, another one. Bible's up, everybody. Now don't go until I tell you to go. Romans 15.2, go. Scott. Scott, could you read that again? Let everyone please his neighbor for his good and his neighbor. Amen. Okay, one more time. Bible's up. <clears throat> Last shot. Proverbs twenty five eleven. Go. Tracy. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Huh? <laughs> okay. All right. Listen, I was going to go to Tim Hortons and get some gift cards for everybody, but I didn't have time. So, you know, we'll do it again some other time. Tim, I'll buy you a coffee sometime. Okay, so all three of those verses, uh, if you look to, through them again, you know, my, my topic for tonight is really about encouragement. And all three of those verses really are about encouragement. And 
I love being around positive people. I love being around optimistic people. I, I don't like, especially optimistic Christians. And, you know, there, there was a story that uh, President Reagan used to tell about optimists and pessimists. And he would say this, that <clears throat> there was a family and they had twins. And one of the twins was an optimist and the other one was a pessimist. So they decided one day to do a little experiment. So what they decided to do was take the pessimist and they put him in a bedroom filled with toys and just candy and just stuff that would make somebody happy. And they took the optimist and they put him in another bedroom and it was filled with horse poop. So they let him sit in the room for a little while and then they went to the door where the pessimist was and they opened it up and the kid was sitting in the room crying. And they said, what's the matter? And he said, oh, that toy is going to get broken. And that toy is the wrong color. And I don't like that kind of chocolate. And it was horrible, right? So they shut the door. So they went to the bedroom with the optimist in the horse, with the horse poop. And they opened the bedroom door. And they looked in there, and the, and the little boy was running around the room, flinging it up in the air, going, wee, wee, wee. And they said, what on earth are you doing? And he said, I'm looking for the pony. <laughs> now that's an optimist. <clears throat> but I like, to, I like to be around people that are encouraging. And, you know, Tim, when I, I, I could only hear a little bit of your testimony, but, you know, there comes a time where a lot of us get a chance to be the encourager. And it's an awesome thing to, to be able to encourage people. Encourage means to give support <clears throat> or hope to someone. So if you would, just turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. And for years, I would send the kids, I would go down to Camp Barnabas with the kids. And we're going to talk about Barnabas a little bit here. There's, there's, Barnabas is an encourager in the Bible, but he's certainly not the only encourager. Um, Moses had Aaron and her, and I'm not going to, you don't have to turn here, but... Um, in Exodus 17, let me just read a few verses. Um, verse 8 through 16, it says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him. And fought with Amalek and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let it down, let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat there on and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side, the one on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua, I thought, this, I thought this was a little funny, but Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Discomfited? I don't know. It seems like he did a lot with the edge of his sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from un under heaven. So they helped Moses and... So Moses had Aaron and her. Elizabeth encouraged Mary when she was uh, pregnant. Um, and I, I'm not going to go to that section for sake of time, but um, she was able to, to encourage Mary when she was um, about to give birth to, to Jesus. Now Barnabas 
was quite an encourager and he kind of, Barnabas kind of lingers in the background a little bit. Um, we read his name every once in a while in the Bible, mostly in the book of Acts, which I will tell you this. Well, you all, you all know how much I like the book of Ruth. And there's other books that I, I, when I read Hebrews the last time, I really got a lot out of Hebrews. Well, I read Acts. Uh, what an amazing book. I mean, it, you know, if... If you're somebody who's into like action movies or something, go read Acts. I mean, there's so much going on there with Peter and then kind of the transition to Paul. And but what what an amazing book. I mean, it's just uh, just phenomenal. So um, in Acts chapter four, Barnabas is an encouragement to the church. And if you look down at verse well, I'm going to start at verse 32, because it wasn't just Barnabas, but, but Barnabas was pointed out. So in verse 32, it says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought, and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, and this is the first time we hear about Barnabas, and Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So in the Bible, it... It talks about the people that were there. And remember, this is, you know, the beginnings of the church. But they, they sold stuff that they had. And they brought the money and they gave it to the apostles to distribute to people who needed and who were in need. And Barnabas, he was a Levite. He was probably an educated man. He, but he, he obviously had some wealth. He took some land and he sold it and he brought it and he gave it, he put, the, put it down at the apostles' feet. So um, they had an opinion that really nothing was theirs. Nothing belonged to them. It was all God's earth-shattering idea. But it's true to this day. We don't own anything. We, we don't own, it's not yours. It's not, and I've talked about that before, but it's not yours. You know, it's, it, everything belongs to God. And if you get that right in your head and you understand that it's a big step, it does not belong to you. If you get a new car and, and look, praise God, if you can afford a new car, get a new car. But take that car and use it for the Lord. Don't be afraid to pick up kids and bring them to church. Or if somebody needs a ride to the grocery store, take your car. And it's amazing to see people here um, bring, bringing people to church. I've seen Evie bring people to church. And I'm not sure I'd get in a car with Evie, but they do. But people do it, you know. So they're using what they have for the Lord. And Matthew Henry... Matthew Henry had a quote that I, that I wrote down. I really liked it. We can call nothing our own but sin. Your sin does belong to you. Everything else belongs to God. But I was reading this as I was going through Acts, and I, I was very reminiscent of Shalom Baptist Church. And, you know, we were... <clears throat> We were a bunch of vagabonds for a long time. We, were, we would go from place to place, and, and there were times, you know, we were at the VFW Post for a while, and we were at um, the place on Indian Trail for a while, but 
always lingering there was, you know, we were kind of hopeful that we would get our own building. And then one day Lena said, hey, there's a church for sale in my neighborhood. And we're like, what? And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. And we really depended on God because we knew we couldn't afford this building. And the realtor, and you guys probably have heard this a lot before, but the real estate agent told us at one point, look, why don't you just take the church and not the house or the land? And Pastor Mills said, no, we want it all. And I was, I was the one, I was like the man of little faith. I was like, listen, Roland, Pastor Mills, if, if we need to take out a mortgage, we, I'll take a mortgage out in my name. We need to get that building. And he said, I don't want to put anybody in debt. I, that's not what I want. So we gave them an amount of money that we could pay. And it was way under the asking price. It was less than half of what they were asking. And we got it. But in the process, the reason I bring this up is in the process, we had to pony up some money we didn't you know we needed some money so there were some churches in North Carolina that helped us out but we also the people that were going to church we said you know we'll give some money and we had to make a commitment now this is why I bring it up and I'm not bragging about how much money we gave or whatever, but I'm sure this happened in every household. We had to have a discussion about, you know, how much can we afford? We still have kids to send to college. We like, we like to eat real meat once in a while at the Bissell House. You know, how can we do this? How much can we afford to give? And then we came up with a figure and everybody gave what they could give. And I'm not talking about a couple hundred dollars, I'm talking about thousands of dollars, but this is why I'm not bragging. I have no idea how much money we gave. I have no idea. I cannot remember. I don't remember how much money we gave. It could have been 5,000, it could have been 10,000. I have no idea how much money we gave when we when we bought this building. But yet at the moment, it was like this big, it was a big deal. And it is a big deal. You work hard for your money. I'm not minimizing it. But in the end, would I do it again? You betcha. Well, I'd do it twice over. The only thing I, I regret is that I didn't give more, whatever it was. But I, I don't know. I don't miss that money at all. It's gone. So. It's sort of the same thing here with Paul, but Paul, I mean with Barnabas, but Barnabas was uh, an encouragement to the church. He set an example. He gained a lot of respect and he had an apostle's reward in the end. But Barnabas not only encouraged the church, Barnabas encouraged Paul. And if you turn to Acts chapter 9, and if you look down in verse 26, it says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, now remember who Saul was and what he had done. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas, and you know, sometimes we see in scripture, it'll say, but Jesus, or it'll say, but for God, you know, but God. But here it says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And I'm going to try and keep moving here. But, but so Barnabas interceded on Saul's behalf. And he said, and really, we don't know in scripture 
we really don't know why, how Barnabas really came to know about Saul, but you know his his change but he did he knew about it and the disciple all, they were all afraid of Saul and we all know why Saul was a killer he, he was a, a bad dude if Christians saw Saul come in they went the other way um, he put people in prison he was there when Stephen was stoned he he was a bad dude but there was a conversion, and Barnabas stood up for Saul, and what a difference it make, made. Imagine if Barnabas never stood up for Saul, and we never had the Apostle Paul. We'd be missing most of our New Testament. And from this time forward, if you read in the, books of, in the book of Acts, It'll say Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul. And then part of the way through the book of Acts, it changes and it says Paul and Barnabas. There's a change. And really, you can see why, because Paul obviously became the dominant figure, and he's one of the most dominant figures in the whole New Testament. But Barnabas to me seems like the kind of person that was okay with that. He'd be the kind of guy that would say, Paul, you can do this. You, you're better at this than me. I'll be the support guy and I'll help you, but you go be in front of the people. You do the, and, and they did. And um, Barnabas, was a great encourager to Paul. Not only was he an encourager to the church and to Paul, but if you turn to Acts 15, and you look in verse 36, It says, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. And we know Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas... This just went off. <clears throat> And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So there's a separation here, and, and there, was, there was a problem, but in the end, Barnabas took Mark with him, and without Barnabas encouraging Mark, we may not have the book of Mark in our New Testament. And now, eventually, there was a reconciliation. If you look in Second uh, Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter four, verse eleven says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So there was a reconciliation. It, it, it came back together, but Barnabas was an encouragement to Mark. Now, uh, Barnabas, we don't know, we really don't know how, there's a lot we don't know about Barnabas. We don't know how his life ended. The, we, we think that he was martyred in Cyprus, but we don't know for sure. Um, but he was quite an encourager. And so I wrote down, who needs encouragement? And one of the categories I put down was new Christians. And look, I know who I'm talking to here. I know this is a Sunday night crowd. And, and you're the reason why I put this down. 
because you're the ones that can encourage new Christians. So I wrote down 10 things and I got this list. I, it's not mine, but I thought it was pretty good. So who needs encouragement? New Christians. So how, how can we encourage them? One, affirm God's love for them. Make sure they know that God loves them. Two, encourage them to join God's mission. It's important that they join a church and they get involved in the church. Three, teach them how to discern God's voice in prayer. We want them to pray. Help them to understand, look, you're not going to hear God from on high speak to you like that. But I'll tell you, the last couple times, like I said, when I read Hebrews, I got a lot more out of it than other times when I read it. And when I read Acts, I'm ready to go home and read it again tonight. I just loved it. It, it was great. Number four, show them how to study the Bible in a group and on their own. Number five, demonstrate the value of Christian fellowship. It's important for, for us. We know iron sharpeneth iron, right? And, you know, for us, man, all you got to do is fire up a grill and throw something on it, and you'll get 50 of us there right away. Six, discuss how to confidently talk about Jesus with others, and that's an important one. Seven, help them consider changes they might make to become more like Jesus. And this one, remember, look, like, like George was saying, you know, you run into people and <laughs> they don't look like us, okay? They, they may look different than us. Don't expect people to change overnight. Don't expect them to come walking in and, and walking straight and being here on time and having everything... It takes time. It takes give them a little bit of time and teach them. Eight, start discerning God's unique call for them. Is there something that God has for them in their life? Can, do you recognize something that maybe they'd be good at? Nine, explore how God can heal their brokenness. And that's a, that's a big one. And, you know, when you hear testimonies like Tim's, you know, and I didn't even, is it Jennifer that you were talking about? You know, I mean, the last thing you want to do is, is sit around and do nothing when somebody really needs help. Um, I'll just leave it there. Number 10, prepare them for rough patches in their faith. Because when you get saved, it's not all hunky-dory. It's not going to change and be great in 10 minutes. So new, new Christians need encouragement. Pastors need encouragement. How can you encourage a pastor? Decide you'll pray daily for him and his family. Every single day, pray for the pastor and his family. You know, when a pastor... I don't know why people get this idea that pastor's kids are going to be perfect. They're not. They're little rotten brats, just like your kids. And... and Sorry, Daniel. They're kids. They're just kids. And, you know, you, 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 you look at them and you expect them to be something more than what they are. They're, they're not. But pray for them. Tell your pastor that his preaching is helping you to continue to grow. You know, the Bible tells us to grow in grace. It says in Peter, grow in grace. And you know how much it would mean for someone to come up to a pastor and say, listen, I'm growing because of your preaching. You're making me think about things I never thought of. Kathy was nice enough to come up to me today, and she lied to me, but she's very, no, I'm only kidding. Kathy is very nice. And she said I, something along the lines of, you know, I always get something out of it when you preach. And that was very nice of her to say that. But those things, they go a long ways, especially for a pastor. I wrote down, pastors are encouraged when the flock is obedient to God's word. They, they really are. You know, when, when, well, you know what I mean. Make your faith real. Put it to work. You know, that's a big one. All this stuff about being an encourager, it's all nice to say. And we say, you know what, um, 
I'll pray for you. My advice to you when you say that is stop right then and there and pray because we, we live busy lives and you'll forget about it and then you know, you'll, you'll kick yourself and say, oh, I was supposed to pray for Tim and I forgot, you know. Um, so don't do that. Just stop and pray right away if you can. I'll show you how to put your faith to work. Amanda, come here. <clears throat> Amanda's my friend. <clears throat> I like Amanda. Now, Amanda... Um, for weeks, your father on Wednesday night has been saying, uh, I have a, an unspoken prayer request regarding Amanda. So we don't know what it is. We have no idea what he's talking about. But God knows. So we, we've been praying for you. And... We pray for you every Wednesday night. We pray for you when we pray. Hopefully we remember to pray for you. I want you to take this. This was supposed to be part of my haircut money. I want you to take that. And will you do me a favor? Will you take your mom or your dad or even you know who? And will you go out and get a cup of coffee and sit there <clears throat> And when you're, when you're having the coffee, just think about the hundred people that are praying for you. Okay? We do that? Thank you. Okay. Sometimes you have to do something to put your faith to work. You have to... It's not just about telling somebody something, it's about doing something. And it makes a difference. I wrote down this quote, it says, <clears throat> hope is praying for rain, faith is bringing an umbrella. There's a difference. So pastors, new Christians, they need encouragement. I wrote down a third group, spinning your wheels, Christians, and I made that up. But what I mean is this, you're in a rut. You're not going forward, you're not going backward, you're just spinning your wheels. They need encouragement. You know, we, you have so much ability, there, there is so much you could do. You, you've got, you all, you're the Sunday nighters. You've got so much knowledge. You have so much ability, but sometimes you're just spinning. How do we encourage them? Well, number one, we maintain a relationship with them. Look, if someone's not here, now I know Kenny's not here. When I look over, I know Kenny's not here. So this morning, one of the first things I did was I asked Rita, how's Kenny? Now, he's not here because he's got a physical reason that he's not here. But some people might not be here because they're not here. They just decided to take the day off. Or, you know, the golf tournament's on. Look, if Jim Steele can be here and there's a golf tournament on, then you can be here too. And today was a really good one. Um, but I wrote down a couple verses. Psalm 34, 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And Psalm 119, 1 says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. You know, encourage them. Show them. Show them that you care and encourage them. And so Barnabas was an encourager. There's other encouragers. I want you to be an encourager. I really do. And there's no reason why you can't. That wasn't too long, was it? Let's pray.